10 Secrets About Moses That Many People Don't Know Number 1. Moses Asked God to Remove His Name from the Book of Life What led Moses to make such a statement, and what can we learn from it? This occurred at the same time as the worship of the Golden Calf. The parable of the Golden Calf sheds light on human nature and the tendency of individuals to stray from their commitment to God. It is ironic that while Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from God, the Israelites were breaking the First Commandment, which states that you shall have no other gods before me. The impatience of the Israelites with Moses on Mount Sinai led them to the idea of creating a new god to go before them for worship. To achieve this, they melted their gold jewelry and used it to construct the golden calf from it. The people's impatience led them to resort to Aaron and they gave him the responsibility to serve as their spiritual guardian in place of Moses. Aaron obediently complied with the request by turning their gold earrings into a carved gold calf, which was specifically forbidden behavior. Then they began to indulge in debauchery, worshipping the idol while also engaging in immoral behavior such as eating, drinking and playing. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down at once, for your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf, worshipped it and sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 32 verses 7 to 8 Moses' descent from the mountain, where the two tablets of testimony met Joshua along the way and came to the people as they were holding their sensual, idolatrous feast. With righteous anger, he broke the tablets of the law as a testament to what the people had already done. Exodus chapter 32, verses 31 to 34. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I have spoken of, and my angel will go before you. However, when it comes time for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. Moses did not downplay the severity of the people's sin or attempt to diminish its impact. They were responsible for glorifying a golden deity. Despite the enormity of the people's sin, Moses asked for forgiveness. This was an appeal to God's mercy and grace. Moses pleaded with God to forgive Israel because of his own self-sacrificial identification with the sinful people. If God refused to forgive, Moses asked to be condemned as a sacrifice for his sinful people. Moses felt that Israel had sinned so terribly that the blood of a god or a bull could not cover it. It had to be a man who suffered in their place. Therefore, he offered himself to be blotted out from God's book if somehow it could redeem the people. God said no to Moses' request, but we can say that God was anticipating the sacrifice of someone greater than Moses, who would give himself on behalf of the people, bringing full and complete atonement. Of course, Jesus had the same sacrificial heart when he died for our sins. God agreed to spare the nation, but reserved the right to judge individual sinners. Now, therefore, go lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. This was God's promise to remain faithful to Israel and to keep his presence with them. My angel will go before you. Number 2. Moses and the Idol of Nehushtan the biblical books of Kings refer to the image of a serpent coiled around a pole as Nehushtan. The image is described in the Book of Numbers following their liberation from Egypt. The people began to complain to God about the conditions of their lives, and as a direct response, God dispersed among them fiery serpents. Many of the people ended up dying, and many more were dying. In response to Moses' prayer, God ordered that a bronze serpent be raised on a pole, promising that anyone who looked at the bronze serpent would be healed from the snake bite they had received. The Israelites began to worship the fiery serpent that Moses had made of bronze at some point between Moses and Hezekiah. 
The bronze serpent is mentioned in connection with Hezekiah's reforms, but the worship of Nehushtan could have occurred much earlier than Hezekiah. 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 4 He removed the high places of pagan worship, broke the images, memorial stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He also smashed the bronze serpent that Moses had made into pieces, for up to those days the Israelites had burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan, a bronze sculpture. While it's easy to see how something that brought miraculous healing could become an object of worship, it was still blatant disobedience to God's commandments. The bronze serpent was God's method of deliverance during the incident recorded in Numbers 21. There's not the slightest insinuation that God intended it to have any future application. It's interesting to note that the literal translation of the word Nehushtan is a piece of bronze. It's possible that Hezekiah gave it that name so people would be reminded that it was just a piece of bronze. It contained no power itself. Even in the situation described in Numbers 21, it was God who brought the healing, not Nehushtan. A powerful lesson for all of us to learn from Nehushtan is that even good things and good people have the potential to become idols in our lives. All our worship, praise and thanksgiving should be directed solely to God. Nothing else, regardless of its incredible history, is worthy. Number 3. Why was God about to kill Moses at the Burning Bush episode? God chose Moses to deliver the Israelites from servitude in Egypt and lead them to the promised land. Moses is also known as the lawgiver and the mediator of the old covenants. The encounter with God at the burning bush, where God invited Moses to be the savior of his people, was a key event in Moses' life. The Lord promised Moses that he would deliver his people from Egypt and lead them to a land of abundance, which is Canaan. Forty years after fleeing to Midian, Moses returned to Egypt by God's command. He went with his wife and sons, Zipporah, Gershom, and Eliezer. But before Moses could deliver the message, he himself needed to learn obedience. He failed to circumcise his own son, Gershom, or Eliezer, possibly due to opposition from Zipporah. Exodus chapter 4 verses 24 to 26. But it happened at the encampment on the way during the night that the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin, throwing it at Moses' feet and said, You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. At that time, she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Moses was about to be exterminated by God due to his error. The nature of Moses' transgression is not clearly revealed in Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 to 26, but the surrounding circumstances provide significant clues. The sacred rite of circumcision, which symbolized the Almighty's covenant with his chosen people, appears to have been neglected by Moses. This could have been due to pressure from his adoptive Midianite tribe. Zipporah, who clearly found circumcision distasteful, may also have persuaded him not to circumcise his son. This would explain her anger. She believed that by shedding her son's blood, she had spared her husband's life. Moses had disobeyed God's commandment. However, God is telling Moses that he doesn't just use anyone. He uses those who are holy and blameless. You and I know that we are not holy and blameless on our own, that we are justified only through Christ. But that doesn't mean we continue to sin so that grace may abound. Moses was about to go back and represent God, yet he had not done what a righteous representative of God would do, even with his own children. And so God sought to kill Moses. God is very severe in his judgments because he is letting people know that he is not a God to be trifled with. Therefore, as Moses was to be the deliverer, he had to work on areas of his own life that were out of tune because God is holy. This level of judgment is also applied to the Israelites. God shows us that he will not use an unjust people to judge other peoples. Moses was unfit to serve as a spiritual leader because of his unresolved sin, and the problem had to be addressed before he could properly fulfill his task. As soon as Zipporah completed the task, the Lord let him go. In summary, 
God was planning to kill Moses as he was to teach God's law to the Israelites, but was violating it himself. Number four, Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. Sometimes the punishment does not seem to match the crime. At first glance, Moses striking a rock in the wilderness out of frustration with the Israelites does not seem like a just reason for him not to see the promised land. After all, he witnessed the ten plagues, led Israel out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, delivered the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, and won many of Israel's battles. So why would God allow a single strike on a rock at Meribah prevent Moses from entering the land that God had promised to Israel? The Israelites complained to Moses about the lack of water and also tested the Lord. Then Moses cried out to the Lord for help, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the rod with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Exodus chapter 17, verses 4 to 6. Water flowed from the rocks, providing drink for the Israelites. Essentially, the Israelites presented a problem to Moses. He turned to God. God gave Moses specific instructions. And as Moses followed, water began to flow. Consider what happens in the second Meribah, when Moses becomes frustrated and disobeys God. Numbers 20 contains the second miracle. The Israelites arrive at the desert of Zin, near Kadesh. Again, complain to Moses for a lack of water. Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 to 13. The second miracle. Then the Israelites, the whole congregation, came into the desert of Zin in the first month, in the fortieth year after leaving Egypt, and the people stayed in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried. There was no water for the congregation, and they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. The people quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the Lord's congregation into this wilderness to die here, we and our cattle? Why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this miserable place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces in prayer. Then the glory and splendor of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron gather the congregation together, and speak to the rock before their eyes, that it may yield its water. Thus you shall bring forth water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. Moses said to them, Listen now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand, and with his rod he struck the rock twice, instead of speaking to the rock as the Lord had commanded, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their cattle drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the sons of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and he was sanctified among them. Moses had grown weary of God's people. Did God simply let this go? They challenged God and challenged Moses' leadership at every turn. At first glance, it seems that God is punishing Moses harshly. After all, Moses had faithfully followed God's instructions up to this point. Could God not simply overlook this? Did he go too far? First, we must understand that the first time the rock was struck prefigures Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 to 5 says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. 
for they drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Moses obeyed God by striking the rock in Exodus 17. As a result, we teach that Moses was punished for striking the rock twice instead of just once in Numbers 20. According to 1 Corinthians, God intended the rock in the desert to represent His Son, Jesus Christ. In Exodus 17, the Lord told Moses to strike the rock to set up an image of Christ as our Redeemer. Christ is our rock and cornerstone, who was struck for our sake, and He will bring forth streams of living water, as stated repeatedly in Psalms and Isaiah. Moreover, the book of Hebrews states that Christ died once for all, and that no further sacrifice for sins is necessary. Therefore, in the scene of Exodus 17, the Lord intended Moses to strike the rock in the desert only once, symbolizing Jesus being sacrificed just once to bring us salvation. Later, in Numbers 20, the Lord instructed Moses to speak to the rock so that the image created in Exodus 17 could be preserved. When Moses chose to strike the rock a second time, he distorted the image from Exodus 17. We would be perplexed by the distorted image if God did not correct Moses' mistake, concluding that Christ, the rock, would have to be sacrificed repeatedly for our salvation. As a result, God punished Moses to ensure that we correctly understood the image of the rock, preventing Moses from entering the promised land. In the process, the Lord created a new image to help people correctly understand salvation. By refusing Moses' entry into the promised land, the Lord demonstrated that we cannot enter into salvation, signifying the promised land, through the works of the law, signifying Moses but only through the work of Jesus, that is, through Joshua, whose name is Yeshua, or Jesus. When God instructed him to speak to the rock to get water for the nation, he struck it in anger. He reacted with anger instead of calmly, and as a result, was prevented from entering the promised land. Number five, the magicians Moses faced, Janus and Jambres. The narrative of Pharaoh's magicians can be found in Exodus 7 and 8. When Moses and Aaron confronted Pharaoh in Egypt and demanded he release God's people from slavery to validate their message, Moses and Aaron performed miracles. Moses held a special place in history due to the extraordinary number and variety of miraculous deeds attributed to him as it is written, all that mighty power and all the great terror that Moses performed. We learn that Moses was unparalleled in power and authority with which he led the people of Israel. We are told that no other prophet like Moses has arisen in Israel since that time. However, there were great rulers of Israel as well as leaders, prophets and priests. But before the arrival of Jesus Christ, known as the Messiah, there was no other man who occupied all these offices in such a glorious manner as Moses. Even with Moses' miracles, he faced opposition from Janus and Jambres. God gave Moses and Aaron the instruction to show a sign to Pharaoh on their first encounter with the king by throwing Aaron's staff to the ground. God knew Pharaoh would demand a sign. After Aaron did this, the staff in his hand turned into a serpent. Pharaoh quickly called his magicians, each of whom was able to turn their own staff into serpents. Aaron's serpent swallowed the magician's serpents, which must have been interpreted as an ominous warning to Pharaoh's court. Aaron's serpent, Exodus, chapter 7, verses 8 to 13. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Perform a miracle to prove your authority, then say to Aaron, Take your staff, and throw it before Pharaoh, so it becomes a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did exactly as the Lord had commanded. Aaron threw his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called for the wise men, experts in magic and omens, and the sorcerers, experts in witchcraft, and they also, the priest magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts and enchantments. Each man threw his staff, and they turned into serpents, but Aaron's staff swallowed their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Pharaoh's magicians were able to perform miracles two more times, matching the signs Moses and Aaron had shown. 
The first plague Moses invoked on the Egyptians was the plague of blood. The magicians were also able to turn water into blood, as Moses did with the Nile River, Exodus chapter 7, verses 19 to 22. Plague of Blood Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over its rivers, its canals, its ponds, and all its reservoirs, so that they become blood. There will be blood throughout the land of Egypt, in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did exactly as the Lord had commanded. He lifted the staff and struck the water in the Nile in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and all the water in the Nile was turned to blood. Then the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. And there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, as the Lord had said. This is a great folly on the part of the magicians. The plagues were a curse from God. Instead of trying to reverse the curse, they decided to turn more water into blood. They also added to the curse of their people. Such is the way of the dark arts, their aim was not to alleviate the troubles of the people of Egypt. The evil one was trying to show importance instead of helping those under his command. It was a mad way of thinking and unfortunately they did nothing to help their people. The second plague that struck the Egyptian people was a swarm of frogs. And the magicians added to the problem by conjuring their own frogs instead of finding a solution to it, which made the situation worse. After that, however, the authority of the magicians stopped, as they were unable to replicate more plagues and admitted that they were witnessing the finger of God in the signs of Moses. Exodus chapter 8, verse 19. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the supernatural finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. Satan had given Pharaoh's magicians the power to duplicate some of the signs that God performed through Moses and Aaron. So, how were the Egyptian magicians able to perform these incredible feats in the first place? Although not as powerful as God, Satan, previously one of God's highest angels, can deceive, emulate miracles, and even predict the future with a certain degree of accuracy. God's power eventually triumphed over the Egyptian sorcerers. They were unsuccessful in calling forth lice. God's strength is vast enough to easily overcome Satan's force. The ability to perform miracles by the power of darkness and the willingness to receive them as authentic will characterize the end times. Just as the power of Jeannes and Jambres had limits, so too does Satan's authority even in the last days. God is still in control. There is triumphant hope in Jesus. Miracles can be used to prove that something is supernatural, but they cannot be used to prove that something is true. These Egyptian magicians were smart and educated men, however. Paul observed that they lacked the wisdom that comes from God. Some of us are amazed by any real spiritual power without carefully considering that real power may have a sinister source rather than a divine one. And even if a new power seems to have the answers we were looking for, we should not be seduced by it, because demonic forces can come disguised as angels of light. Number 6. The Only Man Whom God Buried God chose to withhold from us information about the events leading to Moses' death. Moses ascended from the plains of Moab to the top of Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah to the Western Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, the southern region of the country, and the plain in the Valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zohar. What an honorable title! Moses is distinguished as Jehovah's servant. He exemplified this throughout his life, working hard at everything he did because he waited on God for his instructions like a servant waits on his master and made it his aim to conduct himself by the standard that had been presented to him on the holy mountain. As a servant, Moses was devoted to God. 
You do not see him overburdening or neglecting his office. His respect for the Lord's name was profound. His loyalty to the Lord's cause was unwavering, and his faith in the Lord's word was firm. But servant of God, as Moses was, he must die. It's the fate most men face. Only two individuals can leave this world and enter the realms of glory without ever having to cross the river of death. Moses is not one of the two. At the end of Moses' life, God gave Moses a glimpse of the land for which he had left Egypt. Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah. There is a Pisgah we all must pass over and be gathered to our forefathers. May we ascend as willingly as Moses, the servant of God. The manner of Moses' death is extremely remarkable. The circumstances surrounding Moses' passing are quite extraordinary. Mount Pisgah has a summit elevation of approximately 1,370 meters, nearly a mile. There are not many 120-year-old men who can climb a mountain nearly a mile high and live to tell the tale. Yet, Moses did. He made the climb without there being a trail wide enough for Moses, and he didn't need one anyway. If you're wondering about his condition, this feat will tell you. Yet, here was Moses, almost a century and a quarter old, climbing to the top of a 1,370 meters high peak and having a great time once there. Moses is not full of self-pity. The extraordinary scene of the man of God, alone at the mountain summit, with a view of Canaan spread out below him. He was not taken by surprise. His death had been predicted long ago. Moses knew, some time before, that he was to die without setting foot in Canaan. The great man thus had ample knowledge of his own departure. I must add that while Moses' death demonstrates God's wise mercy, the manner of his death abundantly demonstrates God's grace. After Moses was assured he would die, there was never a complaint or even a prayer against it. His death was the culmination of his life. He realized he had fulfilled his purpose. He was charged with leading the people through the wilderness, which he did. Moreover, he died in the best company possible. Some men die more fittingly in the company of their children. Their strength, having been invested in their domestic duties and attachments to their offspring, who fittingly closed their eyes. But there was no true kinship for the man Moses. Moses died according to the word of the Lord. What a way to live, a hundred and twenty years and not need glasses, a century and a fifth and not need crutches. Moses never sat in a rocking chair, rubbing liniment and drinking ensure. But verse 6 contains one of the most remarkable statements about the whole remarkable career of Moses, Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verse 6. Number 7. Moses' Burial Place And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. God personally buried Moses, the only person in the Bible. Did you catch that? The location of his body is unknown. The Lord then concealed the grave. Why did he do that? Because that grave would have become a shrine. They would still be making their way to Nebo today, erecting shrines, selling popcorn and peanuts, offering various tours, possibly even sending a tram up there with huge banners, declaring Moses' burial place. That's why it was concealed. It was so crucial to the Lord that it even prompted an angelic confrontation. Number 8. The Devil Fought for the Body of Moses Jude verse 9 refers to an event not found elsewhere in the Bible, having to fight or dispute with Satan over the body of Moses, but what this involved is not described. Jude 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. This event occurs in Jude. Here, Jude shares with us an incident not found elsewhere in the Bible. The natural question arises, where did he get this information from? Some say the information was passed down by tradition. This may or may not be true. We have no definitive knowledge of why the dispute arose between Michael and Satan over the body of Moses. It's not unlikely that Satan wanted to know the location to have a shrine built there. Michael refused to pronounce judgment presumptuously. Instead, he simply announced the Lord's rebuke. Despite his great power, Michael remains completely submissive to the Lord. 
Righteous angels have a hierarchy and are submissive to authority. Considering Michael's strength, the archangel's submission to God is even more beautiful. We can see that submission never aims to take away strength, purpose, or the value of an individual. The strength of the angel Michael was not in dispute. The last mention of Michael the Archangel appears in Revelation chapter 12 verse 7 when Satan is expelled from heaven. Confrontation is a necessary evil. Nobody likes it, but it must be done to correct, purify, and unify the community. Number 9. Moses meets Jesus. The transfiguration of Jesus is mentioned in each of the Gospel books as an important event in the life of Jesus and proof of his divinity. Jesus takes only three of his followers, Peter, James, and John, to a high mountain after performing a series of miracles and predicting his own death. This is the scene of the Transfiguration, where his appearance is radiantly transformed, Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. This glory conveys the real presence, for in his person, the kingdom of God is with his people. The inner circle of disciples witnesses the profound revelation of Jesus' identity, as well as his mission. During this transfiguration, two of the most important figures from the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah, appear. Their entrance symbolizes the law and the prophets witnessing to Jesus, the Messiah, who fulfills the Old Testament. Jews see Moses as one of their greatest leaders, but Jesus is even greater. Moses is the one whom God used to give the law, and Elijah is the one who connects the earlier charismatic prophecy of the days of Samuel with the later writing prophets. Moses is also considered the model prophet, and Elijah as the precursor to the Messiah, as mentioned in Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. These verses mention both the delivery of the law through God's servant Moses and the sending of the prophet Elijah before the imminent day of the Lord. Their presence on the mountain with Jesus demonstrates Jesus' majesty as the one who will be called the Son of God and who transcends both. The cloud of God's presence appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai. His Shekinah glory filled the tabernacle. The cloud of God's presence led the Israelites in the wilderness, and the cloud of the Lord's glory filled Solomon's temple. Jesus fulfilled both the law and the prophets, as evidenced by his superiority over Moses and Elijah, whose revelations ultimately point to Jesus. Because Jesus is the incarnate Son of God, the definitive prophet who fulfills Moses' prophecy, the disciples must listen to him to understand his messianic mission. When the disciples look up, they see only Jesus. Their focus is now exclusively on Jesus, as Moses and Elijah would have preferred. For their ultimate significance was in preparing the way for the Messiah, the Son of God, and his redemptive purpose. Although the disciples have received the most explicit revelation of Jesus' identity, they still do not fully comprehend what they have witnessed. Number 10. Moses Sees God Moses encountered God in a burning bush, witnessed God humiliate Pharaoh and the Egyptians, saw God part the sea and provide water from a rock, and spent forty days and nights on Mount Sinai with God. Moses witnessed the signs and wonders of God, now he desired to encounter God himself. He wished for a personal relationship with God, more desirable than all his wonders, works and blessings combined. To know God personally is the greatest blessing any human being can receive. John chapter 17 verse 3 And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. God graciously responded to Moses' desire to know who would go with him by saying, My presence will go with you. The Lord was familiar with Moses, and Moses had found favor with him. However, Moses was not satisfied with their relationship. He desired more of God. Even having witnessed the burning bush, the parting of the Red Sea, seen water flow from a rock, and eaten manna from heaven, all of this was old news to him. He wanted to learn more about God, to have a deeper understanding of Him. So Moses said to the Lord, Please show me your ways, that I may know you. 
Moses was like a man hungry, sitting down for a fine meal. He was not satisfied just nibbling on an appetizer and tasting the soup. He wanted to feast on everything the Lord had to offer. Moses understood what the psalmist said, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Psalms chapter 42, verses 1 and 2. Every believing heart should have this attitude. God is not interested in mere churchgoers. He desires to be known by those who are hungry and thirsty. Indeed, knowing God is the meaning of eternal life. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. Exodus chapter 33 verse 18. Moses wanted even more. He said to the Lord, Please let me see your glory. In other words, Moses wanted to see a visible manifestation of the invisible God to be made public to him and provide an observable display of his glorious divinity. Are you satisfied just listening to a sermon and singing some songs to God, or do you constantly long to see more of God in your life, to understand a greater sense of God's glory? Moses was encouraged to make one final special request, now show me your glory. Above all, it was God's mercy and compassion that led him to renew his covenant with Israel. God then explained how he would demonstrate his goodness and glory to Moses without killing him. He described his appearance to Moses using the terms back and face. God's promise to show Moses his goodness and his glory was fulfilled shortly after, as described in Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 to 7. Exodus chapter 33, verses 19 to 20. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Moses' request was graciously granted by the Lord, he promised to show him a glimpse of his glory. God would demonstrate his goodness to Moses while proclaiming his own name, the Lord. Even granted this extraordinary encounter, Moses would be unable to see God's face because humans could not see his face and live. Exodus chapter 33 verses 21 to 23. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. As Moses stood on the rock, God's glory would pass by. God said to him, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. In other words, the Lord was limiting Moses' exposure to his glory for his own benefit. He could not be subjected to anything more than a glimpse of God's glory from behind. Despite this, his face would literally glow with the wonder of the encounter and the holiness of speaking with the Lord as a result of this limited exposure. Of course, because God is spirit, he does not possess a body and therefore does not have back just as he does not have an arm. No one has ever seen God in all his glory, but the Son of God has revealed him. Indeed, Jesus told his disciples, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. John chapter 14, verse 9. Until then, we continue to walk by faith with God. If this content was valuable to you, I ask for your support with your subscription so that you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. Together, we can enlighten more minds and expand our understanding. Thank you for being here, and may God bless you.